Okay. Um. So thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. thank so, you so very much. Yeah. Please. All right. Okay. All right. So thank you very much for the invitation. So glad to talk. Glad to see uh, Professor Hamanaka and uh, thank uh, thank him for the organizing. So I will give some introductory lectures and then hopefully the results that I am presenting will be used in other lectures, including lectures of Professor Shrubtsov and Bernstein and Dr. and Dr. Bobrova. So okay, so I will start uh, so let's start with the rather elementary things. And um, so we know how useful determinants are in the commutative case. Uh, well, we solve systems of linear equations, so-called Kramer rules. And uh, but but I read that actually Leibniz invented those rules, and uh, there is a property of multiple multiplicativity. So determinant of uh, product of two matrices is equal to the product of determinants. This is what we teach our students. Now, one can show rather easily that you cannot keep both properties in the non-commutative case. So when you consider matrices over non-commutative rings. So one can choose multiplicativity. And it's, it started with Giordano and continued with many other people. Or uh, you can start with the Kramer rules. And um, it was not so popular when we started, but then it turns out that this approach um, has some advantages. Um, so let me just discuss uh, the, the well, actually, almost trivial example. Uh, so suppose you have a system of linear equations over a, uh, over an associative, not necessarily commutative ring, maybe with a division. Now, suppose if, say, A to 2 invertible, you can present uh, X1 just uh, well, multiplication and subtracting those equations. As uh, just as the, the ratio of two such expressions, so and uh, uh, the, uh, for, for the first one, you need that H two two was invertible, and uh, the other expression can be written for x one when a one two is invertible. Uh, so let's look at this expression, say like this a11 minus a12, a22 inverse a21. And uh, there is a temptation to call it something like determinant, so we chose the name quasi determinants. Uh, it definitely has a disadvantage. Uh, this is not a rational expression. Uh, this is not a polynomial equation, just rational. But the advantage is that it has so-called categorical properties. If, if Aij's are morphisms in a category, then you can compose, say, you may can consider this composition, A12, A22 inverse A21. Okay, but you, you can write not only one of such expression, you can write another expression which starts with the A21. And actually, you can also write such expressions with the starting with A12 and <clears throat> A22, provided that the appropriate terms are invertible. And uh, so we decided actually to follow this pattern. Okay, now I am going to present you just a general uh, definition and um, which can be done like this. 
So suppose again you have a square matrix, a, a, a capital A I G, uh, over again associative ring, which is not necessarily commutative. Then uh, let, let me consider a submatrix of A. I'm using notation A, P, Q. And this is just a submatrix of A, which where I removed, uh, uh, where I removed, uh, this is a row of index P and column of index Q. So this is n n minus one by n minus one matrix. Then let me consider this uh, row row matrix. This is the row of index P where APQ is removed. And similarly, I consider column index Q when again APQ is uh, removed. And then the quasi-determinant quasi with the index APQ, APQ is defined, and it's defined only if the submatrix APQ is invertible just by this formula. So as, as you see, so then if you, if APQ is an invertible, then you have actually just an element of your uh, associative ring. Well, the simplest, uh, well, let's do simple, simplest example. Uh, so suppose you have n equals two, you have two by two matrix, you want to start with uh, A12. Then it means that you have to remove the row containing K12. So if you remove the element A11, uh, then you have to remove of just uh, uh, this is the column of index two. You remove a to two. The remaining element is just a a two one. And if it is invertible, then you can just write exactly this expression. Okay. Sorry, I have one question. Mm -hmm. So if the submatrix is not invertible, so quasi determinant is not defined? Yes, we say that it is not defined. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. So it's defined only in this. And uh, uh, so just uh, what, it, what, what, what really is the following, that if your matrix A is invertible, and so B is the inverse matrix. And then if you take your quasi-determinant, you know, the index PQ, and this quasi-determinant is invertible, then uh, you have the element of B of the index with the opposite index QP. So this is what you have. But uh, again, uh, but uh, we prefer to use the definition that I gave uh, just because it's sort of more general and in a sense, it's easy to work with. Now in the commutative case, what you have really, and there is actually, uh, this is just, um, um, so the ratio of, uh, uh, two determinants, which is written here, well, up to a sign. So basically, this is uh, so APQ is not a determinant, but rather just a quasi determinant. Um, now, also, what is interesting and in many cases useful that you can present the inverse elements of APQ. Uh, in the following form, I'm sorry, I have to write here APQ. I, I missed this. Uh, so I missed this, so I will correct the file and send it to Masashi. It must be APQ, so the same matrix as this one. And uh, so you have just the sum of APQ and then the quasi-determinant of in inverse to quasi determinant of the matrix index n minus one minus 
one times helix Q, but also then to this uh, n by n, uh, n minus one by n minus one matrix, you can apply the same formula and uh, then continue and continue, continue. So basically what you will have, you have sort of a branch and continuous fractions. By, by inverting quasi determinants of a smaller and smaller matrices. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm not very good with tech, so I didn't try this as a, as a continuous fraction, but this one. Also, this is actually approach is very useful when you write your quasi determinant as actually as a formal series. But um, I will postpone to this approach for now. All right. So again, this is. I, I agree that this is rather ugly definition which is written. But my actually justification is that it works <laughs> in some cases. So let me, since we are talking about integrable systems here. Let me just discuss so the first application, and I'm introducing so called quasi Wronskians. So again, let A be well in algebra or a field well, of characteristic zero, not necessarily. Then we have a definition of our linear derivation, so which satisfies Leibniz rule. Okay, so let's denote traditionally that the case derivative of f as as it's written here, and let's consider this matrix defined by f one, f two, and so on, f i, and their derivatives. And take this quasi determinant, uh, this is index ii means that I start with, uh, um, with this corner element, which is the uh, derivative of f sub i or the order of i minus one. So this is just the definition. Well, okay, and uh, we can see the case when. Uh, on uh, wi is defined. Now suppose you have a differential operator, which is written like this, coefficients are from algebra. And suppose uh, you, you know that n solutions of L of D, of this, of this differential operator, well, in a generic case, such that uh, Wi are defined, they are inverse, and, and they are inverse is, uh, is, is defined. So then you consider B sub i, this is just a logarithmic derivative of Wi, uh, but uh, so in the non commutative case, uh, there is a long discussion what is a logarithm. But uh, so we're just writing this as a ratio. And then you can present, oops, uh, then you can present your operator uh, as a product of this, of this differential operators so on the first two. Okay, and um, so of course, since you can just order your solutions, so that's in, actually in, in n, factorial, n, n factorial ways, you have n, n factorial decompositions of this operator L of D. And uh, so this was used actually in the paper by Ettinger, Gelfand, and me when we consider, uh, when we consider it, uh, Actually, two the equations system of two the equations. Okay, and uh, let me just discuss maybe a similar approach. And this is now okay. 
instead of A, I will consider R as a ring. Uh, let me consider polynomial over R, uh, depending on T, and to T is central, so commutes with coefficients. And suppose I have right roots x1 and xn are right roots of p of t. Uh, so what does it mean that they are right roots? So that p of t is divisible from the right by t minus xi or every i. Or it means if you have just coefficients of p of t and you put uh, powers of xi to the right, then you will have zero, basically the same. So again, like I did for Vronskians, I will define van der Mons. Again, this is quasi-determinant, which actually starts with the just uh, right uh, low corner, so xi to the i minus 1. Um, and suppose it's defined and invertible. Then I introduce expressions y sub i. Um, so this is xi conjugated by i. And then uh, the theorem actually, that was actually proved by the girlfriend of me, claim that p of t can be presented again, can be factorized as, as it is written here. Uh, so what are, so y1 here is x1, y2 is actually x2 conjugated by this difference, uh, y3 is conjugated by van der Mond, quasi van der Mond, for the three, and so on, so on, so on. Uh, I, I should mention that uh, it depends, the construction depends on uh, the ordering of uh, these roots, x1 and so on, xn. So in general, I will have n factorial factorizations of p of t. And of course, in the commutative case, but in the commutative case, I will yi equals xi, so there is not, nothing new here. Now, suppose that the p of t has coefficients a1 and, uh, and so on, a sub n. Well, I wrote with alternating uh, signs, and this is just, well, I don't know, just for uh, so on. And uh, then I have the following expressions for these coefficients. So A1 is just the sum of by I. A2 is just this is product, Y I Y J, but I is greater than J. Then A3 will be product of three y's also with these inequalities, yeah, i greater to j greater to k. And finally, I will have a sub n equal just this stuff. Oh, okay, and so, and I emphasize that I must have this, uh, the rule that i is greater than j. For example, if I will change this order, my uh, just uh, coefficients will not be symmetric in axis. And coefficients of the polynomial clearly must be symmetric and it, its roots. So I can just then introduce a notion that those AIs are elementary symmetric functions in three variables, x1, and so on, x. Yeah, I may forget about my problem. Okay, and uh, so what is interesting here, so they are elementary symmetric functions. They are polynomials in wise, but in wise they are not symmetric. They are symmetric in axis as 
uh, rational function. And uh, this, uh, this was actually somehow a starting point of our theory of non-commutative uh, symmetric functions and which is now just, uh, well, just uh, interesting and enterprise. Okay, and, okay, I'm um, going. Okay, and to convince you then uh, I can actually, if I know what are elementary symmetric functions, and I can de define other types of symmetric functions by using generative functions. For example, I can generate, generate so-called complete symmetric functions. Here you have just this sum. And I would like to point out that here the indices, uh, they are going so that for elementary symmetric functions, you have this, so say, i greater than j, and here you have the opposite inequality, a1 is less or equal than, uh, i1 is less or equal than i2, and so on, less or equal than ik. And again, in the commutative case, you have just classical complete symmetric functions. And you can also define power symmetric functions. And I will just give you an example. And uh, so the example is written here. So you have y1 square plus y2 square plus commutator of y for each. Well, again, so in, in y's, yeah, yeah, this is not just uh, a symmetric function, but in excess, it will be symmetric. So, and now the general theorem, which is not so easy to prove, uh, and it was proved by our colleague Robert Wilson, and this was a conjecture by Galfant and me, and it said the following, so let the, you have any, any polynomial in, in Y's, which is symmetric in excess, but symmetric in excess as a rational function. Then you can express P as actually <coughs> as a polynomial in elementary symmetric functions. Well, the same you can do with complete symmetric function. And uh, so, um, so the, the analog, of course, is the classical basic theorem of the theory of symmetric function in the commutative case. In the non-commutative case, here is generalization. Again, let me emphasize that it's, it's polynomial in Ys, but it is not symmetric in Ys. It is symmetric as a rational factor. Okay, now let's talk about, now I will skip actually discussing some elementary property of quasi-determinants uh, because the, uh, and just go to, just a second, let me just see how to do this. Um, and uh, I will go to, okay, just like, oh, it, it goes in the opposite direction. Okay. Okay, and I will go to just uh, to the main tool of all proofs on this. It's called so-called heredity principle or, or non-commutative Sylvester identity and so on. Uh, so I will change my notations just to make uh, skip. So when I, I have AIJ, Okay, uh, instead of this, I can just write this matrix and I will just box the element, the leading element of this quasi determinant and it defines it completely. So, in some cases, it's easier just to write this by using this box. Okay. This mm. just Okay. 
Uh, so let me just describe this heredity principle. And okay, and so I will do this on a just uh, basically on a special case, just uh, to clarify the ideas. And so suppose I have matrix A and by N matrix, and suppose I have its submatrix K by K submatrix. For simplicity, I will assume that the submatrix in in the left upper corner. A, but it is not important. This is just easy to write. Okay, so if I have this, so for any P and Q, which are greater than K, so this element APQ, it is not in this matrix A naught, but I can construct now K plus one by K plus one uh, on the so matrix, and so basically it consists of my matrix A naught, which is just in here. Then I add just element this APQ, and then the column above APQ, which is actually on the same level and the matrix A naught, and the same with the row. So again, I okay, have K plus K, uh, K plus one by K plus one matrix. Now, I, I, I have a canonical leading element here, and this will be this, this element APQ because I added this. So I will take this as a leading element for my quasi determinant, this APQ. And so let me just define B as, as a matrix of this BPQ. So P and Q between K plus one and N, so on. And then the theorem says the following, if I take any RS, which are greater than K, then and take the quasi-determinant of B, this will be, and again, B is a smaller matrix. Uh, then it will be just equal to the quasi-determinant of A. And in, just in parallel, in the commutative case, what we have is the following, that let's consider that what we did, but classically, instead of this PPQ, this quasi-determinant, we take just the determinant. And again, we form the analog of this matrix B, which is B tilde. And then the determinant of B tilde is just equal to the determinant of A times the power of the determinant of A. This is just this one. And uh, so this result belongs to so this. So this one. So as you see in the non-commutative case, the situation is simpler. You have just the quasi-determinant of B is equal to the quasi-determinant of A, and here you have just this multiple determinant of A naught to the power n minus k minus one. Okay, now again, since we are talking about uh, non-commutative integrable system, there is a popular special case. Uh, which is called Dodgson condensation or Lewis Carroll identity or whatever. And this is the case when your matrix A naught is actually N minus uh, two by N minus two matrix, which sits in the center of A. So what you do, you take your matrix A, then let's remove the last column and the last, last row and then take the quasi-determinants one, one. Then let's move to the right. We remove, uh, 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 so, so then uh, to the right. So let's remove the last row and the first column and to then take this quasi-determinant matrix one N, then remove first row, row and last column, take N1, and then 
um, and then here we have to remove, uh, sorry, that the misprint must be 1-1. One, one. I remove here the, the first row and the first column. So basically, then I have two by two matrix, C11, and I can take this quasi determinant of this matrix, which is from here, and this is the quasi determinants of A of index N there. And uh, in the commutative case, the determinant of A is equal to the determinant of two by two matrix. This determinants and uh, multiply by the determinant of this n n minus two by n minus two matrix in the center. Okay, so, so this is this. but again uh, this is used uh, we use it several times in integral systems. Okay, now okay so since we are talking about quasi determinants and determinants. So let's try to relate quasi determinants to the determinants. I will consider not all cases here, but just a few. Okay, so well, I start with a commutative case, so the small less obvious. Um, so what you do is the following, okay, suppose of your matrix A, you take quasi determinants of index 1, 1. Then let's remove the first row and the first column. You have then the corner element will be A22, and you start your quasi determinant with this A22. Then let's remove the two, the first two rows, so the first two columns. The corner elements is A33, and so on. And you just, then you continue, and it's clear that if you take the product, you have just this, this here. But now, what is more interesting than the same situation is true for so-called quantum matrices. So this matrix A is a quantum matrix if those elements, if the entrance of this element, they are like Q commute in each row, and Q is a central element, uh, then the Q commute in each column, and then by any two by two matrix, you have the following condition that the, the elements commute on the anti-diagonal and for elements of the diagonal, you have a little bit more complicated expression. Okay, then uh, there's a notion, well-known notion of a quantum determinant of A, which is just, this, uh, you know, just um, which can be done um, exactly as uh, you do in commutative way is actually this the sum of monomials, which are written here, but it's actually multiplied by a power of Q, of Q minus Q, depending on the, on the structure of your. Um, just uh, uh, permutation. Okay, and it's known that uh, this determinant is actually central. So central so that it, it commutes with all AIJs on this effect. Now let's try to do the same trick in the commutative case as we did before. And surprisingly, we have then the definition of the determinant of this quantum, of the quantum determinant of A that is defined in this way. 
Uh, but what's important, and so this the product is exactly like in the commutative case, and as in commutative case, the factors commute. Right. And uh, then uh, Ettinghoff and me actually generalize these results for more general matrices, which are defined by uh, for the fresh etic intact John relations, but I don't need this for this talk. Okay. <clears throat> and now one more example of the determinant of this type. And this is so-called Moore determinant. Okay, uh, this uh, the determinant was actually defined for uh, complex Hermitian matrices, and satisfies and it it has a multi multiplicative function on sorry, uh, not uh, it was defined for quaternionic Hermitian matrices, and uh, it's just multiplicative function on quaternion Hermitian matrices. Now, and so it was defined, I guess, by hand in order to get uh, this uh, multiplicativity property. But, uh, and so let me just discuss how you do this, uh, how it was, recall how it was done. And so you have just uh, so it's just uh, any transposition sigma of Sn, and we know that it can be presented as a product of disjoint cycles. Uh, so disjoint cycles commute. Uh, so we can present this uh, starting with the smallest element. And then we can just order this actual representation just by demanding that the first indices uh, satisfy just this uh, inequalities. Okay, and then uh, for each of those guys, we can define actually cyclic products of entries. So we go AK11, and uh, so we AK, K11, K12, and uh, so on, so on. Uh, and then, uh, so we take actually pairs, uh, just consecutive pairs, and we, we take elements in A of the same given by this uh, pair of indices. And when we arrive to K1, G1, we pair this with the K1, 1. And so, and you do the same for each cycle, and then we multiply. Okay. And again, so this is multiplicative function on Quaternionic Hermitian matrices, but, and it looks actually maybe not so e easy to grasp, but for me, this is again, it has the same presentation. I have the above factorization, and I'm getting just the product of commuting determinants. And they are commute because actually their value will be just uh, real numbers. So, okay, <clears throat> okay. Uh, but now let me just go to more subtle example and which is related to uh, differential operators. And so let me construct now a matrix of um, for uh, differential operators of the first order. So what I will do, so I will take matrix X and by N matrix of um, 
of the formal commuting query. Now, now I take the transpose, and, and then I take the transpose matrix. Now, let me take matrix Z, uh, so which consists just of the partial derivations over XIJs, and that let it be the matrix of corresponding different derivations. Uh, then let me take the product and I get actually operator for the first order. Why I take X transpose? Because I want to have so called Euler operators on the diagonal. And uh, okay, now this is matrix with the non commutative entries. So, what is the determinant? Now, but um, so this is Capelli actually suggests it another a slightly different construction. He added to this matrix XTD uh, diagonal matrix. So uh, zero, one, two, and so on. And sorry, it must be N minus one. Well, again, the misprint. N minus one. So I have this matrix, and then I just by force uh, defined this what's called Capelli determinant, and this is actually as a row determinant of this matrix. So I'm for any sigma, I'm moving along my rows, so first row, second row, and so and I put sigma of one, sigma of two, and so on, sigma of one. Then I take a product and with some sign regulations. And now there is actually the uh, famous identity, which actually constant called uh, uh, this one of the most mysterious identities of the 19th century. But again, but so it claims that the Capelli determinant, which is, you know, just sort of strange determinant of the non commutative matrix, it is equal to the product two determinants of commutative matrix, X uh, entries of X commute and X, X sub D commute. Okay, and so the idea is actually uh, how to present this Capelli determinant in a more canonical way. And let's do the following. So, well, denote this product that we already had, X transpose D as a matrix Z. And let's consider the following matrix. I take my, okay, I will remove first K rows and first for k columns, and I add this identity matrix times this integer k. So everything is actually this canonically defined. And so in particular, when k equals zero, I will have just my matrix z, with positive determinant on the matrix z, and in this, uh, uh, and for the last Z, I will have just the corner element of matrix Z plus N minus one. Uh, so basically, basically what I do, I'm removing rows and columns, and whenever I remove rows and columns, I will add one more identity matrix. And then the theorem says that with this shift, 
and shift by agent just just identity matrix times integer. I will have this Capelli determinant as a product of uh, as a product of commuting factors. So again, this determinant. So this is just sort of a canonical product of quasi determinants, and it's equal to this Capelli determinant. And uh, also then, so similar result is actually valid for, or, or similar result is for Yangian, so-called. Also, there is just, there's an analog of Capelli identity, also just with the shift. And uh, I meant uh, you can look just a book by Moller for this. And then uh, you have an interesting uh, factorization of this Capella determinant to a structure of universal enveloping algebra. And this is because elements of this, uh, you know. Mm -hmm of this uh, actually JLN can be actually presented as, uh, uh, as uh, differential operator from the first order. And uh, so you may have analog of capital identity in this. And this factorization gives you an interesting structure or interesting filtration in this universal enveloping uh, algebra. And this is just, and this filtration is actually related to a so-called gelfand setlin uh, basis. And again, so the results, again, we, we do not need this for right now for integrable system, but there is a paper by six authors on non-commutative symmetric functions. Where um, well, this is so. This is so good fun. Um, so uh, uh, so this is uh, for six six authors. So the first uh, G is for Galfand, R is for me. Then this is uh, should be Galfand, Krob, Lasku, Leclerc, me, and Tibon, and. Um, uh, uh, there is a description there. Okay, and so maybe I will stop now. So I decided that uh, I expected some questions. Mm -hmm. So okay. the talk was actually shorter than I expected, but uh, this one, okay. But let me also advertise what will be in the second lecture. The second lecture, I will define the I will define so-called quasi-Plucker coordinates, analogs of non-commutative analogs of Plucker coordinates, and consider all and consider all possible applications. So applications, and which includes that LGU factorization of matrices, and then. Um, um, uh, non-commutative version of cross ratio and uh, non-commutative version of uh, so-called Ptolemy identity that uh, Professor Bernstein will be used in uh, to present our paper on uh, non-commutative uh, on this Laurent phenomenon on non-commutative uh, mark surfaces. Okay, and uh, the third lecture will contain just more more applications and so on. I will mention, say, uh, some uh, non-commutative um, uh, orthogonal polynomials and other, and other stuff. So I will stop now. That's okay. Okay, so thank you very much for excellent introduction.